became a part of Trimark USA. That is a $2 billion company and they have um, dis distribution centers throughout the United States. When we became Trimark USA, uh, we got the advantages of a much higher exposure and buying advantages uh, for all of our supplies, but specifically with equipment. Um, this, market, uh, this market that we are in had a void for Trimark and equipment sales. So that kind of got us into the equipment game. We, ha we actually have a sales force um, and our average tenure is 17 years. Um, we still believe that it is a people business, that our sales force needs to be out there talking to our customers one-on-one, -on -one, showing them new products, how to be more profitable, um, because there is so much going on in our industry. We sell everything but food. Um, on there, so we sell equipment, small wares, chemicals, and tabletop. The two big categories right now are equipment and chemicals. Equipment because the restaurants that um, have not been open that are trying to open again um, have found that their equipment is no longer working um, or they need to replace it um, on there. And then chemicals uh, as the obvious reasons. So we have um, a full wear washing department meaning that we install dishwashers and laundry machines um, that you probably all have on premise. Um, and when you purchase that from us, you get a worry-free service. We do preventive maintenance. We have 24-hour um, service on there. And then uh, PPE items, face masks, sanitizers, disinfectants, all of that. Um, tabletop, we have from the high end to the low end and everything in between. Um, on there, and that's a little bit about Trimark Adams Birch. And I have the distinct pleasure today to introduce you to um, our our, t our uh, presenter today, Stephen Lyons. He's the corporate executive chef for Clyde's Restaurant Group. Stephen got his start in the kitchens along the docks of historical downtown Annapolis, where he was born and raised. Upon graduating with a degree of business management from Frostburg State University, then following his culinary calling and graduating from the Culinary um, Institute of America in New York City, that would be CIA, but not on the government part of it. Um, Stephen combined his love of cooking and traveling by working in St. John's, Antigua, and the big island of Hawaii. He returned to the mainland for the opportunity to be Patrick O'Connell's right hand um, at the three Michelin starred the Inn in Little Washington in Virginia. Following nearly five incredible years at the Inn, Stephen joined the Matchbox Food Group as the Vice President of Culinary Operations to prepare the group to go national. After successfully growing um, Matchbox into the National Food Group, um, Stephen decided it was time to focus on his young family and he was looking for a company that would keep him in his hometown while requiring less travel when the opportunity presented itself at Clyde's restaurant. Our national uh, capital chapter, our own Patrick Toby or Tobey, depending on um, how you want to call him. He is a certified executive chef himself and he will be facilitating this session. Thank you, Patrick, and thank you, Stephen. I know we all look forward to this virtual education on culinary relationships and the leadership. Appreciate that, thank you, Lisa. Fantastic. Thank you, Lisa, very much. Kate, before we start any further, is there anything else we got to go over? Um, the only thing worth mentioning is that everyone will receive one and a half uh, education, or I'm sorry, activity credits for the session, and I'll go ahead and submit them on behalf of everyone. So that's all we need to know for today. Well, Thank great. You great. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Lisa, very much for that. Uh, just to let everybody know, uh, Stephen and I, just to prepare for today, we uh, spoke the other day, uh, last week, and we thought, you know, we'll set it up for 30 minutes, no big deal. Turned out to be 90. So uh, we guarantee that we're going to go off topic. We guarantee that we're going to take a little bit of side roads. Um, but I really think this is a fantastic opportunity for, for anybody, really, that has been in the kitchen or in the process of moving up up the ladder. Uh, he's got a great story to tell. He's carved his path to success at a very, very high level. Um, and, and, and really, if, if you, even if you haven't been in the culinary environment, uh, he really transcends uh, the entire hospitality industry with his story and his career path. 
Uh, so we're really excited about this. And Stephen, thanks very much for taking to the time today. So let's let's jump jump right in. Stephen, just give us a long and short of uh, walking us through your uh, career path, and then we'll be off to the races. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, I think Lisa did you know a good job kind of doing the overview. It was. Um, early start in the kitchens as many of us have. And, and uh, I don't think, you know, it's a career at that point. Um, you know, it's just something that you kind of love. And, and uh, you know, you, you, as you're going through the paces in there, you're just as worried about being social at 15, 16 years old as you are, you know, picking all the shells from crabs. But, um, you, you know, you, you start falling in love with the culture and the lifestyle right then. You don't know it uh, at the time, but, but it starts really, you know, finding its place in, in your soul. Uh, going off to college, the way I knew to still make money was to cook. So you kind of cooking through college again, thinking, well, don't worry, I'm going to get one of those fancy degrees and never have to do this again. And uh, and then sure enough, you get a degree. And I went back into the field looking for something to do. And the only experience I had on my resume was was cooking. And so I ended up back in kitchens and um, helping in, you know, uh, purchasing as well as on the line when they were short. The chef saw me, said, hey, you know, make a decision. Are you going to do this? Or are you just putting around? And I said, I'm, I'm going to do it. So he said, go to CIA, lose some bad habits, get some knowledge, grow a career. And, uh, and that's what I did right after that. Um, upon graduation, was able to uh, travel, you know, St. Thomas, St. John, Anguilla, Nevis, um, where I met my wife. And I knew that I was going to do sort of five star, five diamond upon leaving CIA. I mean, that, that certainly was, I, I know I wanted to be associated with the best and, and um, you know, Relay Chateau, five star, whatever it was that kind of brought you there. Cause it tended to have the people around that, that I enjoyed working with, very like-minded and, and driven and um, found myself four seasons, uh, transferred with them out to Hawaii and to the big island um, after, I don't know, Four years went and joined Patrick uh, for really a chance. I think I was well groomed at that point in my career uh, to say I had good management and solid cooking, but to really put yourself up and out there in front of someone like Patrick was a, a test for all of the above. Um, he certainly has was a game changer for me. Um, well, I'm sure we'll talk a little bit later of how some of those influences happened, but then. As, as stated, I, I needed to start concentrating on some other bits of my life. And I looked at my past and said, what haven't I done? And, and growing something national hadn't been accounted for. So I, I joined a young group. And at the Times, it was Ted's Bolton, DC3, Matchbox Food Group. And we sold off a couple, grew the Matchbox. And then, um, again, a lot of traveling involved when you're doing openings nationally and stuff. You're in Florida, you're in Texas, you're, you know, you're all, you're in Richmond, you're you know, and, and I had two young kids at this point. So um, wanted less travel, wanted to get back to a spot where I was surrounded by, you know, chefs and uh, less KM approach, more chef approach. And Clyde's presented itself. And, um, you know, most people don't, this position over almost 60 years has only been held by three others. And, um, and it presented itself. I came in, did the tasting, met the team, asked around, and everyone said great stuff about them. Uh, so I, I left at the opportunity and, and here I am, you know, two and a half, nearly three years later, uh, loving it. Oh, that's awesome. Um, you know, when you say there's a reflection of, you know, you look about what, what have I not done or what do I really want to do? And you kind of reflect on yourself and kind of look at the past, but you're really looking forward whenever you, you really, if you could walk us through a couple of folks that were really pivotal mentors in your time. And, and it could be a couple of different ones uh, where really who was that mentor and really what did they, what did they help you uh, achieve or what did you take away from them? Yeah, the, certainly the first three that come to mind is uh, this, uh, Chef Ben, who was the one that, um, is that, that pointed me towards culinary school. And at the time, you know, you had to get the letter and, you know, and all of this to yeah. get in uh, besides the check. And, uh, and, and, and he's the one that came to me when I was, I don't know, undecided, right? I mean, I was working in the storeroom and receiving and, and helping out here and there. And, and then when they had a call out, I jumped on the line one night and he saw me and he's just like, all right, man, you, I mean, you have it, right? Like, let me tell you what this life could look like. And he had traveled the world. This, you know, typical chef fashion, his retirement gig was working at a hotel of 250 rooms, right? I mean, yeah. that's his retirement. And, uh, you know, to others, I would be like, oh my God. But <laughs> he, 
you know, he traveled the world, he'd done his things. And, and, and he said to me, if you're going to do it, let's, let's do it right. And, um, and make, and make, make a great career out of it. And he wrote the letter for me and, uh, you know, pushed me out the door to, to, to really go in the profession. And, and I don't know if I would have done it without him as an influencer. Um, second stop was probably, um, I had some great ones, but uh, Cyril Penier, who is certainly still with Four Seasons, um, classic French uh, gentleman. And, you know, he's the one that came to me when I, I again, I was still kind of living a, you know, the other side of the chef life, the one that, you know, people write about and talk about. And, and certainly it was unsettled in the um, extracurricular world. And, and so... You know, he came to me and I still had a hemp necklace with some shells on me, you know, and I had moved up. I mean, I was, I yeah. was chef de cuisine at this point and I had a temper and, you know, I had all these things that, you know, just, just were off putting for someone that knew better. And he pulled me aside one day and he just said, you know, get, get it together, you know, get the crap off your neck, get the, you know, get yourself organized, realize you're, you're, you know, you're at a level now where you're managing people. And, you, you know, you need to work on your emotional intelligence. You need to get yourself organized. You need to really present yourself in, a, in the light that you want to be respected in. And, and it's time to knock off the kids' games and, and turn the chapter. And, and that was a huge wake-up moment because I, I, I valued his cooking. I valued his uh, friendship. I valued his um, leadership and management. And so it was sort of a, a raw slap. And I think I needed it. Uh, I, I know I needed it now. And uh, so that was a big of course, corner. And then the third being uh, Patrick, um, as far as all, all these speaking of strictly culinary and, and, you know, you go work for Patrick, I mean, anybody that's had the pleasure of meeting him or, or hearing him speak or, or tasting his food, well, I mean, it's transcending, right? I mean, it's, it's a place you go and you walk with him through his inn and he'll stop and just say, I feel like the, that light bulb. And he, feels the light bulb that's on the second floor that's on a little side table has the wrong wattage, you know? And he's like, I think that's a, that's probably a 40. That's supposed to be a 20, you know? And you're thinking, what? And he could just feel the warmth from it. He could see the way it casts its light. I mean, it's that type of thing. And he, and he, and, it, and that happens in his food that happens in his, his um, style of cooking. I mean, when I was trying out there, one of the things he gave me was a can of beans. And when I, and, and I was nervous, I was doing a two day tryout of cooking and uh, one, the new general manager had arrived or his family had arrived and um, I had to cook food for them, which sounds fine, except for they were Turkish and straight. And I'd never cooked that food. So I was already cooking for them outside my wheelhouse. And then he comes and he slaps a can of beans down in front of me where he got it. I have no idea, probably from one of the interns house. And he says to me, you know, Stephen, I need you to cook this and make sure it doesn't taste like beans from a can. And, and I was like, what? So of course you kind of dissect it, you break it down, you pull it all out. And I, I start making them fresh. I'm doing a quick soap beans. I'm cutting carrots to mimic it. And I'm making them soft. And I do the whole thing. I turned it into them. And, and finally, you know, I, I got the job and months later, it took me probably four months or so. I asked him, you know, chef, you know, why, what was with the beans, you know? And he goes, well, I needed to make sure you had a sense of humor. You know, I needed to make sure that you weren't one of those guys that took yourself too serious that you couldn't, that you wouldn't or couldn't do that. And that was just a huge lesson, you know, have fun, enjoy your profession, love what you do, be serious, but, but, but don't forget most importantly to have fun. And he was always one that said he was so lucky to never have to find a real job. He just found what he loved to do. And I mean, I, I certainly felt that, but I'd never heard it put that way, or I never really stopped long enough to think like that. And, um, and, 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 and again, that was ground changing. I mean, by then I, I, I felt like, I've been given a lot of great advice and, and mentorship, and I still reach out to him quite often for his wisdoms of, as he calls it, fantality, part fantasy, part reality. And, um, and I love it. So those are three certain big influencers. That's awesome. You can take a lot out of the, all those little chunks, but you know, that pivotal point of growing up is, is, is huge where you decide that's what I'm going to do and you just go do it. There's yeah. really no second guessing. And, and honestly, with that level of deep detail, with, with uh, Patrick, that's just ridiculous. But, you know, we all kind of strive for that. So, and it's fun. You know, yeah. I guess that's the name of the game. Yeah, it's really hard to figure out, like, when you go through your career, what was really a favorite position? You know, what was the one where, you know what, if I didn't move on, I would still be doing that today. 
you know, we talked about your, your life cycle within the inn um, and, and, you know, what you did and you finally came to it and said, hey, you know what, I think I did everything. And then that's when you kind of moved to the front of the house. Was there a favorite position that you could say, yeah, you know what, if I didn't make that next step, I would still be there today? You know, I, I, you know, I did go, you know, I, I turned the corner there and I did do um, front of the house. And then I, I, I helped an organization for about three months in Florida as, as um, you know, v, some big title corner office VP of yeah. food and beverage, something like that. And what I realized was <clears throat> there was, for me, there was more money to be had, certainly if I pursued the, 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 that angle, uh, the suit to tie to front, the, you know, all encompassing, um, spot, but I missed being chef and I missed, uh, you know, there was something weird. I, I walking through and hearing my name is Steven was odd. And, you know, cause I, it had been a number of years since I had, and, um, and all of a sudden I found myself always gravitating as you do. I think <clears throat> throughout your career, you, 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 first thing you do in any position is gravitate towards your greatest strength because you can make the, the quickest impact. And, um, so even though I was, you know, VP of F and B's and things like this, I was gravitating heavily towards the kitchen end, which I knew wasn't going to be proved successful. However, I was now old enough to realize that that's where my heart was and that that's what I really enjoyed. I love putting on my whites. Um, I love polishing my shoes in the morning uh, and, uh, or at night rather. And I love getting up and putting them on. I, I, there's, you know, sharpening. I, there's just the sounds, the smells, the personalities. And, um, I realized that I, I wanted to get back to that, which I did. You know, I, I, I sought back the white coat and, and the culinary. So I don't know if that quite answers your question, but I mean, it was, it, I, I reached a spot where I knew where I wanted to be was I wanted to be chef. I wanted to spend the majority of my times in, in kitchens and amongst those that are in kitchens. Sure. That was, that was it. Sometimes it's knowing what you don't like that really, put you what you do like. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes you even start out with, tell me what you don't like and I won't deal with any of that. And it's easier, easier to go. Mm -hmm. um, how about, you know, if you can look back uh, and say, you know, in your, your, yourself now to when you were that young, what advice would you say that is really the best thing that you can give um, a young cook or a young person that is really kind of going through that step and, and either from, young person and then you know making that next step what would you feel like that's the most pivotal advice that you can give that person uh you mean starting out from your yeah. sort of line cooking and you're working your way up to the progression yes so i think some things never change right i i think that um you know i i call it the bit of the price of admission which is being productive and getting results and and that's always 101 to me. I mean, that's, that's when anybody joins, I don't, doesn't matter if title or position or anything else. I'm, I'm asking you to be productive. I'm asking you to get the results. That's what we're paid to do. Um, I've certainly adopted from early on to now. I just say it better, I believe, is, you know, the 100% zero philosophy, uh, which is 100% of the time you're taking responsibility for your own success and you're taking responsibility for the company's success. And then, you know, 0% of the time is, you know, not offering any excuse, right? There's zero excuses for not offering your best, um, you know, or great service or great quality at every single action with every individual. And I think that, you know, those, those don't change. Um, from youth, uh, it starts with uh, coming in, showing up, you know, on time, which is in our world a little early. Um, and, you know, ready to go for your day. You know, everyone learns the word mise en place, but, but some people forget that there's a mental mise en place. Um, did you leave the night before with a game plan for the next morning? Um, I think you have to learn to manage the lifestyle. I spoke about a little bit earlier how, you know, this lifestyle and, and I'm sure it still exists can, um, take you down some dark roads, right? I mean, you hear about the addictions and the things that happen to a lot of people. And, and, um, and I think you have to manage that a little bit because it is a bit of a rock and roll still kind of profession. And, um, and you can, you know, you work these hours and you're getting out late and, you know, and I think that you have to manage that lifestyle and realize like, wise up, it's not healthy and, and, and it'll certainly burn you out or, or worse. Right. And, um, and go attention to detail, cleanliness, organization, consistency, time management, communication, um, you know, 
finding pleasure in the processes of cooking, uh, passion. I think all these things lend themselves to a young cook coming up. And if you can channel all of that, and what I found is, is you know, being a young, young student of the craft is that you're, you're really sitting there saying to yourself, you're looking to your left, you're looking to your right, and, and you're measuring yourself kind of against your peers, right? And, and, and I think you do that forever. I, I still look at now my, my lead executive chefs, and these guys are gunning for my job. I know that. And it's my job to get them prepared to take it. And I also know that. Um, and, but, it, but it also means that I, you have to remain that student, and you have to remain that, that regardless of how long. It's my 30th year in kitchens, and I still – you know, I read all the time. I, I, you know, I was just up doing a test kitchen right today. I'm working on some recipes and, and things. And, and, you know, I make as many mistakes as I do successes, but I certainly have a, a, a much more, um, I, I lean much further forward. So when I do fail, I, I fall forward or fail forward, as they say. And, and I know how to pick up, dust off and keep going and not let it beat you down. Um, so I think as you transition from cooking, you know, you have to learn absolutely and i say this all the time is if you don't take the time to learn the fundamentals when you're young you won't have a chance later and everyone's in such a rush to get a name on a coat or you know a business card or you know that extra money that you you forget that everything is built on that foundation so if you build it strong enough with the knowledge and everything else that you need to be successful because ultimately as a chef you just got to be a great cook right that that's the number one quality is you're a great cook the best in the building arguably and so if you're that, you build that foundation, build a tent on it, build a skyscraper on it, doesn't matter. You have something that can support it. As my parents always said, and I shared this with you that when we spoke the other day, Patrick, you know, and I, and I love them that they did this. They always tell me, you're supposed to be broke. You're in your twenties. Like, yeah. I mean, what, what do you think? You're, you're, you're supposed to be some fancy guy. Yeah. Like you're not, your twenties yeah. prepare you, you know, to give that foundation and spend the time on really getting good because if you do that, then it certainly points the angle for where you're going to hit in your 30s. Or, or again, using yeah. time doesn't matter, right? You might start in this profession later if you're a job changer. It doesn't matter. It's still dedicating those first early years to, to the foundation. Those next years are really where you you found a bit of your groove. You're starting to enter into the, the management side, the sous chef side or chef to party side. And, um, and that's where you, 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 hopefully you're still on track. You figured out what you love. You've checked a lot of the boxes. I've done banqueting. I've done garmage. I've done you know, uh, I'm a great saute, I'm, I'm great on the grill, but you still know where your best strengths are, right? I'm a really good saute guy, or I'm a really good saucier, whatever it is, you still have something that you, your love is. But now you realize you have to oversee a lot, a lot more, right? You're managing the day to days and stuff. Um, sous chef doesn't make any difference. I think the biggest thing there is transitioning from cook to sous. It, it's probably the most difficult, especially if you do it within the same four walls. Um, because these are the guys you used to hang out with. And, you know, go out with and yeah. do everything right you're a friend and and drawing that difference is you know i, I say to my guys all the time look I, I'm, I'm hoping that we have a great relationship friendship but i'm also here to make sure that we get the results and so if that comes at a you know sometimes a difficult conversation you have to be willing to have it and um yeah. that transition is yeah incredibly difficult well, that that mental skill set you talk about where you know if, if you can't cook and you don't know your numbers and you don't know any of those things that's a non-starter you have to know all that stuff that's your concrete evidence that if you don't have well you're, you're done um and then you can really progress on what's your mindset yeah uh same thing with the competitive side of looking at the guy right or left you know i knew i was going to kick their butts they'll kill me to death they'll absolutely destroy me because I'm brand new and you're trying to figure it all out. But then tomorrow I'm going to get better than them. And you sure. really have to have that what's next attitude and what am I going to do? And if you don't have that hunger, how are you going to really survive? Um, and yeah. then how are you going to thrive? Uh, it, how, how are you going to get to that next, next, next level? I'm, I'm huge about, <clears throat> you might've heard, I'm sure there's similar analogies that you know, when you come to the crossroads and I always talk about the crow in the crossroad and, and, you know, sitting in the old tree. And, and I say, when you get there and you have that conversation, cause there's a few times in your life, you really hit big forks and, and no one has a crystal ball, right? You just know what's inside you. You know, your desire, hopefully you've had some great mentors. Um, but, but it's really a time for self-reflection. And, and when you hit that, that crossroad and that crow kind of says, you say, well, which road should I take? And, and he says, well, where do you want to go? 
And if your answer is, I don't know, well, then it doesn't matter, does it? You can take either road. But if you say, I want to do X, then they can give you an answer. Take the road on the left. Sure. And I think that you need to, you know, everyone says, what's your 10-year plan? You know, I don't know. I mean, 10 years is a long way away. I'll tell you what, I could tell you what this week's going to bring me. I could probably tell you what I want to um, get done this year. And, and I certainly have a three-year that, that's, that's a moving target. And then I have a five-year that's where I believe it to be. But we all know that if you, if you asked your 20-year-old self what you look like at 40, you could never guess, right? I mean, so. I thought I'd be dead or rich. Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm neither. So. <laughs> that. <laughs> but that's a, that's a, um, but that, that's a huge thing for me. You're right. It's, it's, it's looking forward at all times. It's knowing what you want. It's, it's staying focused and, and driving to it. And, you know, and I think that's, this is, I'm speaking certainly towards culinary, but I don't think it changes anywhere. I, I think if you're goal driven, I'm, I'm certainly result oriented. I know that about my personality. Um, I know I have to be in a place that's going to uh, allow me to achieve those goals. I, I'll never settle for mediocrity. I, I think that that's just, in, in just bad word. It's a four letter word for me. And, um, you know, I, I'm always striving for excellence and, you know, the, the, or as you know, chefs always blame, you know, there's no such thing as perfect, but it, you know, if you aim for perfect, then you achieve excellence. And I think that that's pretty darn good. Um, doesn't stop me from putting my head down going, I think it'd be better tomorrow. Yeah. But, yeah. I think that's really in, in transcending all of the really our industry and club world of what are you really going for? What are you really doing? Are you going through it? Or are you growing through it? Are you actually taking that next step of that extra little bit each time to, to get yourself better? Because once you get yourself better, you can then leave as long as you kind of have the mental capacity to do so. Um, and that kind of really, it, it brings me back to um, culture. Uh, you know, a lot of the stuff that you talk about, I mean, if you're not strong in your mindset of knowing what you want, knowing where you want to go, and you know, you don't have to know, all right, in 20 years, you know, I, I'm going to wear camo and be a fisherman, you know, when I'm 20 years uh, from now. But, you know, there's a lot of time between here and now. And you know, talk a little bit about the culture of, really how it evolved over your career path and really, you know, the big influencers of culture that you want to create. What do you bring to each new organization? Sure. Um, I think, you know, that's great. I mean, culture, gosh, talk about fit, right? I mean, and, and, and I will say, I think all of us need to recognize that there's a high chance that we're going to hit at some point in our life, we're going to take something regardless of the amount of homework that we've done, which again, I'm super adamant about. I don't go into anything without knowing everything about an organization that I can find, right? I've right. researched right. Their players, I've researched their anything and everything that's visible. And still then, sometimes you can't see behind that curtain right. and, um, and you just don't know. And, and I think that you have to be honest with yourself and, and to the organization if it isn't. Um, but I would say your percentage of, of being at the right place at the right time in a place that's going to help you grow and, and you're going to contribute to is, is, is all about that culture and doing your research. So um, for me, I think starting out, you don't know everything you want other than you're looking for a fun place to work. Uh, you're looking for hopefully someone that um, invests in you and your time, but you yourself have to know like I'm, I, how do, how does it best work for me? Am I in an environment where I love to be um, told this is what you're doing? Am I a spot that it's you're going to work your way up the brigade? Is it a spot that you know? Is it a club setting? Is it an independent restaurant? Is it catering? I mean, you can go so many different levels, but culture of an organization uh, for me tells me how the leadership really is. And and again, when you're young, you don't know it. It's a feeling. Um, and I think as you work through it i i always found myself um i love i i love responsibility and I, and I love coming up in a place where you were you were given a task and you have to get it done right that that th this is your station this is your responsibility and, and when you think about it now i mean it almost makes me nervous thinking about how much trust and faith was put in me as a young cook without even you know i, I was influencing that guest experience more than i could fathom and now, you know, then, and now I look back and go, geez, they trust me to, you know, break down all the lamb. They trust me to, you know, yeah. bone the quail. I mean, what happened if I left something in there, you know, and, 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 and I thought that that was something that really stuck with me uh, as I kind of kept coming up was finding places that 
match my desire to be the best, match the, the idea that it's, it's certainly a, it's a competitive sport, if you will, it's a competitive yeah. profession, but you are on a team and, you know, it's that old, you know, go fat. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go with a team. And, and I certainly found myself um, looking it around and saying, if I went into an organization and there was a couple people that, you know, seemed so outside, like everyone kind of clicks and, and this, I knew it wasn't going to be a spot I loved. Um, I could go in and certainly learn. I mean, you learn anywhere, but you know where you're going to stay longer because there's a feeling of camaraderie. Like I won't let you down. You don't let me down and, and you carry each other's weight. Um, and then as you get up and it becomes your turn to start, um, really controlling culture. And, and, and I will say, and I'm, I'm sure you said this as well, you know, the culture is determined by the worst behavior leadership will tolerate. Right. So in, and it, to break that down simply, if you put up a bun, you know, as a cook puts up a bun, you go, Hey man, it's a little dark. And he go, you know, next time I want you to, you know, less toast, you just set the culture, right? You, you just said, it's a, it's okay. Right. Uh, if there's stems in my parsley, you know, chop part. I mean, I've set the culture. If dull knives are acceptable, I've set the culture. If, if swearing is okay or radio playing or whatever it is that you determine, that's your culture. And, and that's the, whatever that worst behavior is. So if leadership is, has collective clarity, focus, and alignment, I think that you can enter in and, and really establish what, a, what, a, what the culture clearly is, which is, again, I, I, the word fair, we kind of say, I don't love the word fair other than the fact that you know what you're going to get, right? If you, if you burn that bread, you know it's not, I'm not going to say to you, hey, you know, Patrick, that's fine, and then turn to Stephen and say, Stephen, it's not fine. You know, in that sense, I'm going to be consistent. Um, and, and that's it. And once you have people that are all clicking and working together and they're, and they're using that hundred zero mentality and, and they're, and they're self-critical and they're improving endlessly. I think that's the culture. I know that's the culture that wins. I know at that point, people want to join that team. They want to be part of it because they feel like they're, you know, it's so cliche, but you're part of something bigger and yeah. you can really feel it. And, you, and, and, and the team gives it to you. So and then anything that comes in there at that point that starts going left or right, you know, it, it won't last. The, the, the culture is so strong in an organization like that, that it's no longer the, the leader doesn't have to say something because it's going to happen from, well, I shouldn't say leader, the, the highest ranking officer doesn't have to say anything because everyone's a leader in there, right? You don't need a title to be a leader. So, you know, the, your, your small take could look over and say, hey, man, you know, you got to clean those chanterelles with a brush, right? I mean, just what are you doing yeah. with that paper? right? No shortcuts. So I think that that's, to me, that's hopefully answer your question. I mean, I think culture is, you know, huge. Yeah. And it's that fit, you know, when you know, when you walk in an organization, you're like, yeah, this isn't me. Or, you know, I, I went to a job where they were big into guns. I had no idea about guns. I was like, wrong place for me. I was yeah. like, but, you know, you got to know that fit of, of walking into a place and you can just feel it. Yeah, there's energy there. There's, you know, and especially in a kitchen, you yeah. know, that is, you know, when, and most people that, that had not gone to culinary school, I mean, you didn't realize you got thrown out for not shining your shoes, thrown out for not sharpening knives, thrown out for, you know, not having your, your jacket have crease in them. And it was very militaristic. Uh, yeah. And, oh, and yeah, you better, you better. hierarchy. <laughs> oh, yeah, you better. And, you know, yeah. did you have the T in the back or the three or, you know, and, and it was, if you missed more than two classes, you got dropped and it was an yep. automatic letter grade and it was highly competitive. And yep. uh, so that mentality coming out of school was really lots of knees and elbows. I'm going, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to be better tomorrow. Um, and it's interesting in, in seeing some kids coming out of culinary school, not all, not definitely not all. I don't put everybody in a whole bucket. Um, but it's a, a person has that mentality for, you know, and that's what you talked about of, you know, you were entrusted with a lot of faith that you were taking care of the guest experience and you didn't even realize it, but they right. saw that in you and you had no clue what you were doing, but you just knew I had to do X. Um, yeah. And that's really cool. Like the whole uh, fit and the whole culture of what you want to do and you know when it's right and you definitely know when it's wrong. And um, it, it's interesting. You talked a little bit about how, you know, the differences are in mindsets of becoming from a line cook to a sous because you got to go from friend to manager and that mm -hmm. gets weird. Um, talk a little bit about more about coming from a sous 
to exec sue to exec chef on how that uh, how does how does that go from one to the next to the next and what level you got to be at? Sure. Yes. Uh, so, you know, sous chef again, and, and, and let's say that, you know, in some, depending on your organization, right, the ESC isn't always available, right? I mean, yeah. you know, which makes it that much more difficult because you're talking about making a serious leap if you're going from sue to to exec chef. And then, and then let's face it, in some organizations you have chef de cuisines. Yeah which are those that are, you know, those are the people that, you know, in lots of these environments, they can't stand meetings. They can't stand emails. They can't stand anything. Right. And, and they are a cook's cook, tried and true. And, and they're like, look, I'll never do whatever that is you're doing in there. And, and the, you know, I just want to be dipping tasting spoons and things and creative and that's my jam. And, and, uh, and, and that exists too. Right. And, and I think yeah. that, that's okay. Uh, you, you, you know, that's fun for a while until your knees and hips hurt and you go, dang, I, I better learn that computer thing. Um, but, uh, but I do, you know, transitioning sous chef, um, for me, I always work with my guys, uh, myself as a sous, I knew coming up where, what was next and, and how do I become the senior sous? How do I become the go-to sous? And, and, and I think that you have to, it's all, you know, it's a very school analogy, right? So you're, you're, you're going through grade school and you become a fifth grader and you're, you're, you're cool. You know I mean? Yeah. You're, you're deciding what you, which field you're playing kickball or whatever the case, right? You're it. And yeah. then you become a peanut again, and then you work your way up to eighth and then you're a peanut again. Then you go through high school, right? And, and, and so on and so forth through high school, you know, from a freshman to a senior's huge changes and the same as college and so on. Well, profession isn't much different, right? So you first become a Sue. You're, you're, you're just a, you know, you're a glorified line cook with yep. key, you know, I mean, <laughs> you, you know, and, and you're, you don't know what you're doing really. I mean, you don't, you've never really, hopefully they saw the natural ability for you to, you know, manage others and, and, and influence others and inspire others and, and really kind of get the, the ball moving, which is how you got to your position. And let's say you've already worked over that relationship difficulties of, you know, Hey, look at work. I'm, you know, this is who I am. And, and, and outside of work, probably less likely you're going to be doing what you used to do as much, but, mm -hmm. but um, you know, it doesn't mean you can't go have a nice fishing trip or something or whatever it is that you still bond on and, and make team on, but you know, life changes. And then I think as you begin to move through being a sous chef, it, it's the same. You worked your way up to be the best cook, right? So you've worked every station arguably in the kitchen and, and let's say, you know, some will argue broils the hardest or, you know, broiler, or, you know, grill or, you know, saute, typically one of those you're going to end on. And, um, and it's the same. Now you're a Sue. Well, guess what? You got to go back to AM again. You got to go back and learn how do you, how do you get the eggs right? How do you get all that products in? How do you, you know, realize that, you know, the mamas in the morning might be a little different than the, than the, 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 you know, big egos that come in at night. And, um, and you have to start again and learn from the bottom again, every part of that opening, uh, process and, and what does it take to set a day for success? And how do you do this? And, and then you work your way to being, you know, the big bad Sue at night, you know, the guy or the, the lady that's walking in there that commands the respect because they've, they have the chops. They've earned all their, their stove stripes. They've, they certainly shown that they can run the um, uh, systems uh, to set a day for success. And now here you are running, you know, the shift, right? The, the glorified, you know, big, big shift. And, um, or you're in charge of banquets or, 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 you know, catering or whatever's, I mean, huge revenues there. And, and, you know, I, I used to despise that aspect of it. I, I just was not a good banquet cook. I always knew it. <laughs> and because when you're, a, when you're a true stove guy, I mean, yeah. the, the thought of how do I, you want me to put 2000 things in no, a blueberry yeah. and feel that where? Yeah. And, um, I'm going to play it two hours prior to the banquet. What yeah, the hell? Exactly. Yeah. What, what you, they're going to put how many of my plates on a, on a what, on a tray? Yeah. Um, so, you know, there was this whole thing and, and, I, and I realized really quickly, find someone that's really good at that because yeah. to watch them is amazing. I mean, they can cook steaks in a field using sterno in a hot box to a perfect temp, right? Yep. And, 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 and they're marvelous. But again, hire the right person, you know, see what it is and understand it, have a good working knowledge of it. But to our earlier conversation, know, know where your career is going. Um, and then I think here's where it is. You're finally a good senior, you know, Sue in the building. You're, you're well-respected by all. Uh, you've probably seen some turnover in your tenure at this point. Um, you know, 
how are you going to make it to that next level? And I, and I think the biggest part, I guess, that lies in there is, you know, when do you realize it's about one life influencing another? And that's where you're ready for the leadership side of stuff, where you realize I've gone from managing the corn and the butcher, you know, lamb and all this to you really now managing people and leading people. And, and you'll find that happens somehow naturally that you've gone from being, you're always product obsessed. We're all product obsessed, but now you're people obsessed and you're always trying to figure out how are you making the best culture? You're the go-to person that they're coming through. You now have the answers both for culinary as well as for people. You found yourself in a position where you're not just that, that authority on every dish. You're also become a great authority and, and a person that people come to about their career. And you're that, you know, they're coming for advice outside of just how do I, how do I, you know, yeah. do these shallots. And, and I think that's when you're ready. And, and it's just like that foundation we talked about earlier. If you don't have the foundation to build a strong cook, you're never going to be respected as a chef because you, you, you got to be able to walk on the line and take over literally if you had to and help out, not take over is a bad word, but jump on the line and help out and be like, well, chef's on the line and they're going to crack. <laughs> <laughs> right, they're gonna give you some. They're gonna jab you left. Oh, they right. love it. Hey, the old man's out there. Yep. Mm -hmm. You know when you show them like what you. I mean, I remember Patrick jumped on a line one time and started just cooking this foie, and and and, it, and the pan was hotter than anything I'd ever seen. And I'm going, oh Lord, where's he going? And and he and he moved with this grace of you know, 50 years of cooking foie gras, and it comes out. And he makes his pan sauce and he puts it over, and then we cut into it. And we're like. I, I've never seen one. So How do you just do that? <laughs> How'd that just happen? How, yeah. We do it every day. Exactly. You know, 50 times a day for the last five years. And he just banged this thing out. And like, it was yeah. like, okay. so you always have to be a great cook. But, but I think that that's the difference when you go from, when you go from uh, Sue into that ESC, into that uh, final step, you, you know, you realize it's beyond your kitchen. Now the relationships you have with senior leadership and senior management in the, in, in the rest of the building, um, you know, the accountants, you know, the, the, um, assistants, you know, the, you, you, you know, the, the GMs, you, you know, HR, you know, the grounds team, you, all of a sudden, when you show up, you realize, you know, everyone from the, from the doorman to the hostess, to the, you know, gardener, to, to the pool attendants, to the lifeguards. And, and you're, and you're part now of that property, right? You're part of that. Yeah. They, they can't believe that what it would be like without you. And, um, and at that point you realize you've, you've really found a great spot to be. You mm -hmm. found um, uh, an environment that's recognized you for all the work you've put in and you have people now following you and wanting to work for you. And, and you're always the place that everybody winds up going, whether it's a house or whether it's work, everybody eats. Right. You know, everybody has that in common that even in a club, you know, there's tennis players, there's golf players, there's, you know, whatever else we have amenity wise, but everybody eats. That's the tie that bond and, and, and it's big. You had mentioned something the other day and for all the F and B's on here, they're, they're not going to like this, but it's true. Um, you know, when you go, when you transition that thing from chef to F and B and he said something the other day, he goes, Oh, well, F and B was created because chefs didn't want to go to meetings. That's right. absolutely true. <laughs> and for years I hated meetings. And then all of a sudden I'm like, all right, I could, I could, you know, it was a game that I'm like, oh, I could make this meeting do this, this, or this, or I could set it up, or I could script this meeting, and I know exactly what's going to, I don't even need to be there. Um, but, you know, talk a little bit about that, you know, taking that plunge, because, you know, you're coming from a place that you're the grand poobah, you know, and, and you know who, who the guy is when you walk into any kitchen, you know who the person is. And then when you got to step out of that comfort zone and now you're in the front of the house and now you're facing different challenges of, of how did you really come to grips with that? You know, trading your jacket for, for this jacket or, you know, one tie for another, you know, talk a little bit about that process. Yeah. <clears throat> it's, it's always interesting. It, it, some it, people it, can do it. Some people can. I think that's the, you know, first reality is, is, um, you know, very few um, want to do it. Uh, very few can do it um, because it is so different, right? I mean, you, you know, chefs don't realize how nice it is not to have to deal with the guests. I mean, and, and I mean yeah. that in the most you know positive way. I mean, that's that's 
you know, you think it's demanding when your ticket has 19 modifiers. Try taking the order. That guy's right um, next to you yelling at you. That's yeah. a whole other story. <laughs> so, Let me go um, back in the kitchen. Chef's going to yell at me. It's okay. Right, right. <laughs> the, um, but no, I think when you make that transition, I, <clears throat> one of the things you realize is very quickly, you, 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 know, you know a lot less than what you thought. Um, when you when you enter the F and B side of things, and or you get out from the kitchen, whether you go, you know, assistant GM or whatever path you're on, you you, you know you, you go to rooms division to learn something or whatever that may involve, I think you you realize real quick that you don't know half of what what goes on, and um, you know your your wine knowledge. I'll stick to F and B first. You know this, and you know your knowledge of wine, your knowledge of spirits, your knowledge of you know how you should move to the table, the grace of which doing it, how to make each guest feel king or queen of the day, how to um, run a good shift meeting, how to, um, in our case, you know, for me, it was, I was also in charge of housekeeping. I was in charge of our, our hosts, I was in charge of our doorman, you know, how to tell them to, you know, look on the book, know who's coming and how to, you know, you know, where they're, here comes a Virginia tag, you know, and they had a seven o'clock reservation. You probably know this is Mr. and Mrs. Lyons or something. You know, are you reading their luggage tag real quick and giving them mm -hmm. the wink nod? Are you, you know, and that's just, you know, getting the person welcomed, um, mm -hmm. let alone inspecting a room or, or working with them. So I think that when you make that jump, you have to be humble again. Um, you, you, you're, again, given the position because you have a, skill set of your your management and leadership are obviously recognized at that point and they know that you're one of those that is going to learn all that that's necessary those little side bits that you have to go but you also know how to get the most out of your team and the people around you which is no different than the kitchen right i mean that you still have to find a way to get there you know i always say you can delegate a task but not a responsibility and that's one of my biggest things i delegate tasks all the time throughout my day to my chefs to i have two right hands and, um, but at the end of the day, I'm the one reporting to it, right? At the end of the day, I, it's still my responsibility to have the results in. I just happen to be able to give them the task to help me get there quicker. Um, same in the front. I think if you take that humble approach, you still understand that the responsibility is yours. You could get, you know, you can certainly get some tasks out there for teams to help you, but know that people are still looking for you to be the guiding way you know you're still pointing the compass you're, you're, you're still that one that's creating the culture you're still the one that's now has to go back and deal with an environment you're very comfortable with but you can't overshadow it right you your your natural tendency is to be like well, that's not how i did it or this is how i do it. you know the old joke how many chefs has changed the change the light bulb does it take does it change the, and it's you know it's three one to do it and two to tell you how they did it at their last job and so, you know, it's that same thing, having that approach where you walk into the, into the kitchen and, and, and if you don't give the respect to now the person in charge, whether it was someone you groomed or whether it's a, 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 an incoming new individual, you, you've lost, right? That relationship is so crucial that you don't undermine their authority uh, in, in a house that you're very comfortable in. Um, it's going to be nothing but terrible. So for me, I guess it's, Looking at when you when you take on that F and B, um, go after the with the same hunger you did your culinary profession. Go after learning those things that you need to get up to speed quickly on. Um, really embrace the team. Really, you know, take a minute as we do anything, and and you know, don't go in and change stuff for the sake of change, right? Give it a second to figure out why things are being done in the way they are. You might have seen it through a different lens where. You know, we, we look through three lenses, right? I look through the lens of the critic, I look through the lens of the guest, and I look through the lens of the employee. Those are the three lenses that every time we walk through a building, we have to look at. Same thing, I tell my guys, hey, listen, unless there's a, a signed only direction, when you leave or come in, we're such creatures of habit. Sometimes take a different route in, take a different step yeah. in, walk out a different way, yeah. look around, see something different, because we get so, we are habitual, but, and that's very beneficial in a lot of cases, but especially when you get an F and B, you're always walking around and your head's moving from floor to ceiling, wall to wall, nonstop. And, um, and appreciating that and all that goes into it, I think is, is certainly one of the ways to be successful. Right. You, you touched a little bit on it. Um, and I want you to expand a little bit more on it if you could, when you went from, when you went to Patrick O'Connell and said, okay, you know, after being the chef, you're like, all right, I pretty much have taken this as far as I can go. 
And then when he approached you and said, hey, I want you to do for the front of the house what you did for the back of the house. If you could walk us through that transition, um, that would be really helpful. Yeah. Um, so it was exactly that. I'd come to, I'd come to the crossroads and, um, uh, and, I, and I sat with Patrick and, you know, the option was keep on doing what you're doing in, in, in a, um, certainly under a shadow that was a great shadow to be under, but it was yeah. nevertheless still, still you're in a shadow, right? You're never, the end of the wash will always be Patrick's as it should be. Yeah. And, um, and I didn't want to go work for any other chefs because I didn't think there, you know, the, his, his um, colleagues that are equal, um, I wasn't going to relocate New York. I wasn't going to, you know, so I started looking and saying, I'm not going to work for another chef of this quality. I feel as though I've, I've checked that box. Um, he said, well, to, to your point, he just said, well, how about this? How about you do everything that you just spent creating our kitchen now into this, this culture that is, it's a winning team. It's a winning attitude. It's, it's, I love it. Um, can you do that out front? And I said, I'll, I'll certainly I'll give it a try. Right. Had, had, hadn't really ever done it. I'll give it a try. Um, went out. And what I realized was what was missing was some of that, what helped me be successful in that was I came with the focus. I came with the disciplines. I came with the idea that I knew there was certain things we had to achieve as, as a front of a house to represent the food, the way that we always thought it should be. Um, I, I knew that, you know, our stand up meetings should be that right. Our, our staff had to learn to not just read off a menu, the ingredients. Now ours were pretty flowery and perfumed yeah. and, you know, things, yeah. but you can't just read off. It's got, uh, onions and yeah. carrots and it's like thanks I, I can read um so how do you how do you really get to the guest and and tell the story right it's living theater and and that was the the art is how do you take everything that you had back there bring that level of passion finesse uh discipline but do it in a manner in which the guests kind of enjoyed it right they, they saw it as wow, like this is just, how did you know, right? The little subtle movements of where a certain glass went, a slight change in a, in the rim of a saucer, knew which water, like, you know, all these little wink nod things that we had going around, hand signals from across the room that were subtle, but, but allowed us to know where to be and when to be there. Um, so for me, the, the way I found success was one, showing them, you know, the, w the way we move, the way that we hold ourselves to, you know, the omnipresence of our service staff to always be available uh, to the guests, but not overbearing. Like, the, you know, if the guest kind of looks up, you, you, you know, they're looking for, you know, you know, someone looking up, admiring the chandelier is very different than someone looking up, looking for a server. Uh, the intuitiveness that you have to have, uh, the product knowledge. I, I, I mean, I give it, look, a great server is as talented as any sous chef in their knowledge of product. And they need to be, and they need to know technique. They need to know ingredients. They need to know origin. They need to know all this. And I don't think they understood that until we started really going into it. And now it hit them like, aha. And they were never stumped. I mean, if you did, we always had, please allow me to check. But good Lord, just saying, how's your, you know, where's your veal from? Uh, let me check with the chef. No, you, no, you got to have those answers, right? I mean, that's just, you, you should know that the wallpaper silk, you should know Martha Graham did that dining room. That chandelier used to be in an old French barn. This, you, you need to know your ambiance. You to, yeah, you need to be the story. You need to be a concierge. You need to be a, a chef. You need to be a psalm. You need to be so many things. Yeah. Um, it's game changing. Did, did you have, when you moved to the front of the house, did the guys that were, the, the folks are still in the kitchen, did they feel like they had more of an advocate in the front of the house? That, okay, one of us went outside. So you know, this is going to be a different thing. And, and did that relationship at all change? Or did you say, wow, guys, you have no idea. Once it hits that door, you don't see it anymore. Now it's in the hands of them. And this is what they do and why they do. It, it was, it was certainly a learning for all. I would always attend, um, you know, shift uh, yeah. lineup in both the kitchen and the, um, and obviously run the one out, out in the dining room. Um, and, I, I did think, I think in the beginning, it was like, all our problems are over. A chef's out there. <laughs> Whip this puppy into shape. No food. You'll we'll never take a plate too soon again. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, and it was going to be this instant solve, which it wasn't. I mean, it wasn't. I, I, 
I was able to go after certainly some things very quickly that that yeah. were, were ground balls, right? Anytime you take a new job, there's ground balls. And, mm -hmm. and it, you know, the things that really build your momentum and easy to go after. And, um, and we did that. And, and, but, but there was learning on both sides. I mean, I certainly came back and said, you, you know, this is, we can't go on that ticket, right? Here's why. I know you're firing at seven minutes, but you got to hold off. I didn't give you the go. And they're like, well, we don't have time to wait. And it's like, well, what do you want? You want me to walk around the dining room with it? You know, right. And, and, Cause you're not going to bring it back. So I think there was a bit of learning on each side. And, um, certainly it was beneficial for me knowing that kitchen because I had such a relationship. I think the hardest thing is when I go in the kitchen that I wasn't the authority. I mean, Patrick's mm -hmm. always the authority, but I, you know, but your day to day, your whole shit, I mean, you run it at, at, at there as an ESC. And so I think if you're sitting in there now, I had to look at the chef who happened to be one of the gentlemen that came up with me there that I brought on and I had to look at him and talk to him with the respect he deserved and the position yeah. that he earned. And, and I had to say, chef, I need, you know, this is what I'm looking for. I need, you know, hold up on 42. I need you to go on 16 and you got, you got to switch. You got to trust me on this. And, and that's where all of a sudden we formed this, you know, any barrier between the heart of the house and, and the front of the house, we just tore it down so quickly. And I think that's really the advantage of coming from the kitchen out. It was, the barrier blurred, right? There, it didn't exist anymore. We, we now all of a sudden our team doubled in size and our success doubled in size. And you know, mm -hmm. it's gone on to be the three Michelin that it is. And and I think it's that that inner working, that ability for each person to realize how you know a server is needs us to be successful for them to be, and vice versa, right? Without each of us working at our best, we're not going to get to the levels that you need to be. And that and I think coming from the heart of the house that really helped. Got it. That's, that's pretty cool. How is it that, you know, when you're GM of a place and you're kind of over a place, now you're in a different role. I mean, you're a corporate chef, so you're kind of spread all over the place. And now you got to like, for lack of a better term, share your love over for a whole bunch of people. Yep. How did you find that transition? Was it, was it simple or was it more like, okay, I got to get used to this again? Well, it's probably going to be like that, but how did you, how did you deal with that? Yeah, I, um, you know, I approached it with um, the idea that I need to be, I, I need to, I'm dealing with long-term strategy. Um, I, I'm, I'm saying this is where we need to be by the end of this year or the, by, you know, I, I sort of have my goals further out and, and I start forming the team around that. Um, it, it's, you know, I, I love everyone to be on the team. I want everyone to stay. I want everyone, to, but I'm, I'm crystal clear on, on my expectations when I when I enter an organization, this is how I speak. This is what I look for. Uh, this is what I, what I want for me. You know, the bus will stop maybe two three times. If you want to get off, that's fine. I'll, I'll help you. You know, I, yeah. I, you're a great person and all that. But if you don't if you don't like where this is going, I, why why go? You're not we're not going to be successful if you don't want to go there. So we kind of work our way into that, and then really you know finding finding the way to deal with each. Um, individual and, and, and their strengths and, and of course their opportunities is, is my greatest uh, challenge day in, day out, right? I mean, I have some that need daily conversations to keep them feeling good. They, you know, there's the, there's the guys that want the pat on the back. There's those that just want you to show up and hit them hard, you know, pow, and then they go, yes, yeah. chef, and they, and they love it. Right? They thrive on that. They want you. Mm -hmm. They find something wrong in here, you know? And, yep. um, and, so really learning the personalities of the team, um, trying to divide my time equally is difficult because naturally those that are in greater need get more of your time. And I, you yeah. know, it's probably guys like, I haven't seen you in, you know, in three weeks. And I'm like, that's probably a good thing, you know, yeah. and be, um, happy. <laughs> be happy, be happy. You haven't seen me, but, yeah. but it's a good thing that they want you there. So, yeah. you know, they want to show off what they've done and, yeah. You know, in, 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 in the world, I travel around a lot. I do about 3,500 miles a month, um, you know, just driving around the DMV area and, and stopping in and doing it. But one thing that we also have area directors, so we have two of them, they each see over sort of a group. Um, you know, these restaurants and those kind of split evenly. And so what I try to do, what I aim to do is as I'm going through my days is I'm there, I, I'm really honestly there to take pulse readings, I look around for their opportunities. Um, I help remove any barrier they might be having. I'm making sure that what we're working on is is clear, 
that they know where we're headed, that they understand the vision. Um, and, 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 I, and I tend now, what's the nice part is, I don't have to be the jerk, so to speak. I get to be a bit of the nice guy finally. And, and, and <laughs> you know, we have the ADOs who are your guys that kind of hammer on labor and, you know, everything else. And, you know, I work, I speak to them multiple times a day. And I'll never, again, I think the biggest thing for me is to never undermine the authority of the chef in the building. I, I might be, you know, the corporate chef, but when I come in, I'm very clear that it's their restaurant. I'm very clear that that's their, their team, right? And, and, and sometimes you get the person who runs up, hey, chef, you know, I've been asking for a raise and, you know, I'm like, <laughs> you're barking the wrong tree. You know, <laughs> this is right over there, you know, it's not me. It's the process. And yeah. I said, look, I'm available. If you make it through these other levels, if you spoke to your chef, you spoke to your GM, right? You, you, you discuss it with your area director. I, I'm here, right? I'm available. And I'm, I'll certainly listen to you if you have something that you want to share. But I'm telling you now, I'm bringing it back to your chef and your general yeah. manager. Yeah, they're going to know you spoke to them. They're going to know. I won't do, I never change anything. I don't wait till they're off. I, I don't even ask my chefs their schedules, quite frankly. Just tell me when you're on vacation. Yeah. Um, but if, you know, I assume you, at this level, you know where you have to be and when you have to be there. Uh, mm -hmm. If you don't, it's going to show up very clearly in your team and in your in your um, sales and your mm -hmm. food quality and your guest satisfaction and things mm -hmm. of the such. So, I think for me, it's um, managing it all is is it's fun. It 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 can certainly be a bit of um, uh, a you know pull you in a couple different directions, but. If you're good at communicating, again, that, that collective clarity, focus, and alignment for me and, and great communication, if you can nail those, then I feel as though the position's, uh, you know, certainly achievable. It's, it's fun. It's day-to-day -day good. Well, that being said, how do you really deal with your work-life balance? Because that is a really hard thing for as you're crawling up the, the, the um, pole or the ladder you know, you just want to work. You just throw yourself into work and it's a grind and I love it and I, you, you live for it. But then all of a sudden, wait, and I'm married and you got two young daughters at home. And, and how do you, how do you create that time and space? Yeah. Um, Nothing better than being called dad. So best know. feeling in the world. Absolutely. Um, I, I was clear when I get hired um, that I will either see my kids for breakfast or for dinner. Yep. Um, I, you know, there's exceptions. I get it. Sure. Uh, always are, but but I, I'm very clear on that. Like I'm I'm a family guy, you know, and um, you know the mentors that we talked about earlier. One of the best things ever said to me, and all of them said it. Graham Quayle, you know, I mean, I had so many great guys, and and Jim Babian, and they all said in one way or another the same thing, which is do not watch your kids grow up behind a video camera, right? And that's that, uh, speaking to our age, right? But that was everyone yeah. carried around that big thing on their shoulder and, yep. and you know, the VHS and. And, and that was it, though. But th that's how they watched their kids grow up, because they were so in the grind, day in, day out. You missed every soccer practice, every violin rehearsal, every play. And they just said, don't do it. Just don't do it. And, it, and I heard it so much coming up by, by some great mentors that I knew that was important as I started having kids. Yeah. And, um, and when they're younger, it's, it's a different need, right? I mean, yeah. you're, 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 you know, you're... I think that time, I think it's more about helping your, helping your wife. Yeah. Which, uh, she which, needs to shower. You yeah, need to right. Shower. I mean, it's more about being there as a husband, yeah. uh, almost at least as equally as being a father. And yeah. then as I get older now, I mean, my men are still young. I mean, 10 and seven. And, and, um, and I said, when I started Clyde's, I said, look, you know, I'll be there for breakfast or dinner. I'm not missing both. Right. right. I get lunch isn't going to happen. That's fine. But I'm either going to sit down and, and teach some values and morals and, and, uh, you know, where they need to be as, as young, you know, kids growing up. Um, and that's either going to happen over some flapjacks or that's going to happen over, you know, some steak or whatever. And, and, and that's fine. And, you know, I, I think the reality is we're scared to say it sometimes, but that's it. I mean, that, you, you draw the lines where you know, and, 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 and I know that I've got my day this many hours to accomplish. And I get up at 4.30, I start my day early. I like to have that quiet time and I, you know, I clear my box. I, I have my plan for the day already set. I still do it. I still plan my day the night before. Yeah. My, yeah. My, my coat's pressed. It's on a hanger. My shoes are ready. Everything's ready to go, you know, and, and so my morning, you know, I take my dog for his walk and I come back and, you know, my cereal is already poured. I mean, it's freakish, but, yeah. you know, but I have it so down to a T because I don't want to rob that. I would rather have that time later with my children. So yep. I, I start the day, I go through it. I make my rounds. I go where I am. 
And then when I come home, that's it. I'm, I'm, I'm home. Mm-hmm. Now, what I will say is anybody that calls during that family time we're having, um, I will always say, I'll call, I'll call you later. When I put the kids to bed, I have no problem, right? I mean, I, I need to be accessible on my days off. I need to be sure. accessible after. That's what the job entails. And I'm not going to say, sorry, not talking to you. I'm off today. That doesn't exist in our world. It's hospitality. So uh, people know you're not, you know, I'm pretty predictable in my schedules now. So they know. And um, if it can wait, they say, hey, listen, no biggie. Can you catch me first thing in the morning? I'm, I'm opening. And, and I'm like, yeah, great. And that's what we'll do. But if they need me, I, you know, I took two calls the other day on Saturday and I took another call on Sunday, which I, I was off this week and because they, they needed it. They were working on a menu item that was due on today and they, you know, need it. So I think drawing those lines and, and being very clear with, with your hiring boss or with your team and um, knowing that there's always going to be the odd chance that you're going to have to dig in for the 14th hour. It happens. You know, there's the time where you have, we used to have festive season and you knew for the whole month you were working. That's that. You know that if you're short staff, you're going to cover it. You know, if you're, you know, guys on vacation, probably going to demand another hour or two of you a day. But if you work well with your team, you can get all that back. There's a day, and I got to tell my guys, look, I, I don't measure your hours, right? I, I don't measure activity. I measure results every time. So if you're like, I've been here 14 hours, you're probably doing something wrong, right? Figure it out. Like if you have a full team, you, you staffed well, which is, again, the most important, and, and you're ready for the battle every day, you've planned it out, and you're subject to change if necessary – you need to be able to sit there and say to yourself, I, I, I can go home, right? Open up the, you know, make believe drawer, put your stuff in it, put it away and know that it'll be there in the morning. If you've set yourself up and you always take care of everything important, then you can deal with the urgent. If you let your important items become urgent, you're done. Right. Because then you're just constantly putting out fires. You can't deal with them. Your phone's going off the hook. You're not prepared. So more than ever, I mean, Instead of, you know, hey, guys, this is what's important to me. This is what I'm going to achieve to do. When I'm here, I always move Friday night mentality. We talked about it. I move fast. Um, I talk fast, move fast. That's my day. But when my day's done, I'm, I'm going to, I'm, yeah. I'm moving home. And mm-hmm. that's that. Yeah. I love it when people just don't get you because you're like, I'm really fast. I talk like this. This is the way it's done. And they're like, oh, my God, it's always like that. I'm like, yes. It's, yeah, yeah, it's I'm not going to change. Yeah. It's intense. Yeah. But, but it's it's the way you're wired and it's the way you kind of go through life and how you look at it and, and you know, either get on, get on board or let me help you be happy somewhere. Yeah. And that's okay. I, that's, yeah. There's great conversations to have. All right. So I'm going to switch conversations now to let's talk about future. You know, what do you feel, um, you know, what, what the culinary trend is going to be and what are you preparing for in the future, you know, short term and kind of like midterm, because long term, I don't really think we know what's going to happen. But you know, short term, midterm. Yeah, um, the end of the world, apparently. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it, it, what a year, right? I mean, I mm-hmm. never, never in my life has or anyone's for that matter, have we seen something like this. So it, I think what it tested us the most on is, is how nimble are you? How, you know, if you're rigid, oof, this would have been a hard 2020. Yeah. If you and, can't pivot, um, yeah, you're done. You got to pivot. And I think it, it taught people real quick, you can accomplish a lot more than you thought, right? Your mm-hmm. teams went down small. Um, you, you, you went back to me, you talk about, you know, having that foundation. You, you, you yeah. were probably working a grill there for a little bit, right? Mm-hmm. And um, you, you weren't used to it, right? You were expo or you, your day was kind of more on that side. Now, all of a sudden, you're really involved in day-to-day stations. And hell, I was busting suds at a couple spots just to help them out. Mm-hmm. And, um, and that's, you know... That was the, so, so the immediate was how do you how do you get up to an, uh, a nice level of um, sustainable loss if that's a, even a word um, yeah. at this time where you can sit there and go okay we're, we're managing this well we're climbing every day we're pointing in the right direction um, however we're still not operating at you know the levels we were pre twenty twenty um, so labor look right that that you know the immediate was how do you how do you look at labor and really you know it gives you an opportunity to say, wow, we, we were a little fat, right? We we're just a little scared of pairing it out and um, getting down to the right level where you're still driving great quality. You're still not stressing the team. You're yeah. delivering it in a fast manner uh, and every other thing that needs to happen, but you're doing it a little bit leaner and, and, and that's never changed. I, I think where people forget is, you know, how can I do it with less? And I'm like, well, you know that one, good, and you're always like, oh, you know, my, my, my one good cook, Sandy. And you're like, yeah. And you're like, well, if you go to Sandy and say, Sandy, uh, you know, let's say, sake of argument, she makes, you know, 15 an hour. And we say, Sandy, I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you 
19 an hour if you do the job of you and, and that person that bothers you every day because they're never getting their stuff done. Uh, how about that? And they, nine times out of 10, they say, yep. So you lose a person that's making 15 doing nothing. You're throwing 19 at a person that deserves it and your product's better and they're quicker and the line's cleaner. And, uh, you know, and it's so that mentality really came to shape now. Um, menu engineering, uh, you know, the old classic stars, dogs, you know, you go down the sure. list, kind of, you know, what are you looking at? What's contributing? What isn't to your menus? Um, how many one-off items were you carrying before? Maybe, you know, maybe you didn't realize I was bringing in this one bread just for that dish, um, but it didn't matter then. Um, so I think menu engineering and cross utilization is important without looking silly, right? You don't want to sit there and go, we have a secret sauce and it goes on everything. Um, you need to, you know, you need to say, listen, what, what, what sells? Look at your P-Mix. You already, you, you already know off the cuff, but you'll be surprised by one or two items. And then making sure you're, you're not so small that there's not options for your guests, but that you're not so large that you just have those things that you enjoy doing because you're a chef and you felt like you needed it. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, you sold five. Yeah. Um, yeah. So <clears throat> I think managing you know, those two, uh, your inventories, your, your, your menu mixes and things is the, is the first where everyone kind of went. Second is, now it's time to have fun, right? You're running lean, you're running mean, you got good cogs, everything's, you know, where it needs to kind of fit. Um, and then you say, well, what do we do? Do we do pop-up? Do we do ghosts? Do we do something else out of this space now that we have that I've been wanting to do and our guests have asked for, and I think it would be fun or something of this nature. And you're seeing a lot of that, right? You're, you're creating yeah. meals both for carry out, um, whether it's take and bake, I'll just use that as kind of the verbiage. You're seeing a lot of that now where, hey, you know what? Let, let me get that family four pack for you and you can take it home and here's some heating instructions and, and uh, you know, beats going to the grocery store and you know our quality and, and people love that because they, they, they crave it. And um, you see, in, or they're picking it up warm, right? I mean, I think this year's holidays, how much we're gonna, we've seen already Mother's Day, Easter and what yeah. we're prepared for, for Thanksgiving and, and Christmas and New Year's. I mean, there's huge revenue to be made in, in off premise. Um, you and know, a lot less expenses. And a, and a lot less so you, that's that's a good that's a good day yeah it's, it's a yeah it's a win i mean and 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 so i think that everyone in the, in the immediate and, and near future is certainly curving to look at ways that we could continue to offer outdoor dining service longer everyone's got the heaters fired up and you know we have plexi where you need it or you have still good sanitation practices we still wipe down we go to disposable menus or qsr menus you know the little scanners on yep. your phone um i think that that you're, you're, you're watching, um, I mean, nice part is it's false, so everyone feels a little bit better about it yeah. out there, but, but who knows what's gonna happen with it. But you, you know, there's this, I guess there's this overarching of, you can't take your foot off the pedal right now. I mean, you just have to stay, and everyone's exhausted. I know I've done oh, yeah. more in this last six months than I, I thought fathomable. I mean, it, we're, we're all carrying a few extra bags under the eyes and um, have learned a lot, but, looking at carry out stuff, looking at ways to hit curbside, looking at, you know, how do, how do we navigate this third part delivery system for, for at least our side, it's, it's difficult yeah. because once it's, you got some guys showing up, you don't know how they're dressed. You have a spot where they are designated to pick it up because maybe yeah. they're not the most savvy looking, you know, sure. person. Yeah. Um, it's different stress. It's it, different stresses. Mm -hmm. Your bartenders are, you know, for a while they're getting people back was hard because they're making more money on unemployment yeah. In a safe environment than coming back to where they're, you know, bartenders now don't, their job's so different, right? You can't sit at a bar, you can't, you know, and, um, yeah, those are the guys driving the nice cars coming in later in the shifts, you know, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, cooks are in the jalopy, bartenders make a big money. Now all of a sudden, oh, yeah, not making the money anymore. Yeah. And how do you reinvent yourself into getting back? And I, I think all of us are doing that across the board, whether in clubs or in restaurants or, hotels is a whole nother ball game, but you know, how do you get back to that? And it, it takes a lot of ingenuity and thought process to get back to it. Hope to God that you're not bleeding so much that you can stop the bleeding, figure it out and move on. Yeah. And deliver I, and nothing. You know, the thing that never changes is the guest experience. I mean, right. if, if you stay focused on that, you, you know, you never take your eye off of that ball. I, th I think you, you have just such a greater opportunity of winning and, you know, packaging has become more important than ever. Um, 
you know, you know, your accuracy and fulfilling carry out is more important than it's ever you still been. Still got a branding. You still got to keep it out there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the marketing side of it. I mean, firing up those engines is is mm -hmm. is you know a whole new way. How many blasts is the right amount? How many is too many? Yep. Um, you know, people have options. Your click rate and how how much or how deep are they going? Yeah. 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 Your analytics are are huge. I mean, you know, our IT guys one of our busiest. You know, I mean. Yeah. Uh, hey, what's happening here? How are you doing there? What, you know, are we using talk for this and are we using Grubhub? Are we using, you know, gold belly? Are we using, where, where are we going next? And, and, um, you know, we set up bakery sales. We've done, yeah. um, every weekend we do something out of that kitchen. We, you know, wines, you know, we found ourselves with these, I mean, we have great sellers with great wines and stuff that you, you know, they're not getting out there. You, you, you couldn't right. even find some of these things. And, and, you exactly. know, good Schaefer estates, I mean, you know, good luck mm -hmm. finding it. Yep. And, um, and meanwhile, now we, we, you know, we went to selling those and, um, and I mean, we'll sell in a week, 400 bottles. Yeah. And good deal to the guests. Good deal to us. It's just dead stock. You win. Yeah. And you could sell it out because it's not doing anything on your inventory shelf. Not doing a thing. Maybe and um, we've done a lot of charities work. Um, you know, we've done a lot of food at forwards, feeding thousands. And, you know, I think we did 50,000 meals to um, underprivileged this year, yeah. um, you know, or underserved communities. And I mean, so I think you got to, you got you to look at every, you got to fire up every single thing you have in your book and, right. and, and just when it's not working fine, you know, take a left. If it is working, exactly. keep going. Mm -hmm. Um cool. Well, really, last topic. I really well because uh, I want to leave a little bit, a couple minutes. If there's any questions, because because you and I could just keep going, and it's true. who cares about who's on the, the Zoom call anymore? <laughs> we'll just it'll be three o'clock and be like, oh, nobody's left. Um, <laughs> you know, if you could really think of one leadership quality that that you really is essential to, you know, kind of what you want to get to get you where you want to be. You know, what is it, and and how do you get it? Um, I mean, oof, one, um, I know. Yeah. It's tough to put it on one. If there's a couple, it's all right. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I, I think it's, I think it's the, um, you know, it's that whole improve endlessly, right? It's that, mm -hmm. it's the devotion, it's the pride, it's the, it's, it's the desire. Um, I think they all kind of are in, in one way or another, the same word. Um, yeah. You just have to, you, you can't stop. I, I think that that's the biggest thing. And sometimes we're exhausted mentally, physically. And, you, you know, you owe it to your, yourself. Um, you owe it to those that, that the company that's, that's hired you. You owe it to the people that work with you, alongside you, for you. You owe it to the guests that's come in there to just never stop um, trying to be better than you were yesterday. And, and everybody's like, oh, you're doing your best. And it's like, you know, sometimes it's not your best, it's doing what's required. And then other times it's realizing that, you know, my whole goal is whatever I did yesterday, right? I'm going to be incrementally, whatever that little bit is better today. And I'm going to learn from whatever I did yesterday. I keep, you know, I'm still old school. I got my little notebook in my back pocket. <laughs> and, and every day when I get in my car and I'm, before I enter my ways and try to navigate the traffic's, I, I sit there and I write down three things. How did I, how did I, you know, do something positive for myself today? How did I influence my own self? How did I influence um, one of my, you know, reports? And, and, and how did I do something for my guests? How did I change those three things for the better today? And if I can't, after, you know, 10, 12, whatever hours, if I can't come up with three of them that quick, you know, I, 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 I failed, right? I, my book's pretty boring. And you need to, every day should be something of that nature. And that's that endlessness, you know, of, of constantly seeking that, you know, I, I said, you know, I have this constant devotion for this industry and, and those three things I make sure, and I, I tell everyone the same thing. I mean, you should be able to check those things off 15 minutes into your shift, get alone, you know, the end yep. of the day, but, but that, that's what I do. And, and that's how I push myself. No, oh, I appreciate it. Um, Kate, I don't know if you want to open it up for questions. I would think that there, there might be a couple of folks that have some questions today. And while we got them, this is the time to hit them. Who has questions? I, I have not. I have not seen anything on there, but I know there's about 35 people on there. So yeah, if anybody you know. has any questions, go ahead and send them through the chat screen. I can also make people um, 
like I can allow them to speak also, I think. Technology, that is another byproduct of what we've been going through. I've had lots of people teach me how to do all this. It's most, most of all my kids. Radio silent. Got it's so odd. I mean, Here's Q &A. of anything that we are not radio silent. So. <laughs> okay, Stephen, favorite restaurant in Naptown. Oh, gee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, favorite. Um, I don't know, Boathouse. It's or, I mean, it depends on what I'm there for. I think Boathouse for the family friendly. Davis's Pub if it's pulling up on the boat and with the wife and having a cocktail or a beer. <laughs> yeah, I, I like their approach. I, I think they're simple uh, food. I, you know, they're, they're not pretentious at all. They serve good Maryland fare. The vibe's fun. Service is welcoming, knowledgeable. Uh, parking's relatively easy. Um, so love it. Okay, let's see. As culinarians, what is the best thing a new young manager can do to earn credibility with the back of the house? Oh yeah, um, I, I think it's it's you know as as in anything, it's respect, right? It's it's asking, it's it's go back there. Do you know everyone's name, right? I mean, do you know everyone in that kitchen from dishwasher, steward, cook, you know everyone? I mean, that's the first thing you should come in and say, hey, good morning, good afternoon, good night. I always I always make sure I don't leave the building till I thank them for service. Um, I, I if you know if I'm the first in, people come to me, obviously. Good morning and. And, and if I'm walking in and the shift's already begun, I go around to every station. I still do every day. And I say, good morning. How are you? What's going on? Anything new? And how's the, you know, I remember a little fact. How's the dog? You know, I know I got, you know, bit the other day. What happened? And, you know, or anything like that. And I, I think as a young manager, um, building rapport with them will save you so much time in the long run. Cause they're going to start sharing with you, talking to you, giving you things that are, are helpful. And then, um, you know, learning a thing or two. I mean, make sure your knowledge is there. I mean, ask the questions about the dish. If, if you have lineup, see if you can join it. Go and ask a, a good culinary question. Hey, I, I know that we do, you know, research. It don't sound, you know, silly. Like, how'd you get those marks on that swordfish? Um, but know that, hey, listen, I, I know there's a, I don't know, uh, people prefer, you know, their duck um, to have rendered skin and served medium rare. What? Why is that? What's what really happens I, i've eaten some jaw can i get it gets is it more gamey is that you know get involved a little bit without sounding silly but but show them you're interested in what they do i mean out of anything chefs are full of pride and um we you know sometimes we like it when we get to show off a little bit about what we know awesome so brandy waters was the one that asked what your favorite restaurant was and she said she used to manage maria's she's our newest chapter member so oh, I, I meant to say maria's yeah <laughs> um okay there's a few more here let's see um what is the most innovative thing you have done this year with covid most innovative this year with covid um geez um well we created these we called them red boxes um which we designed our own I don't know. I mean, and it, it's not overly innovative, but for us, because it, it, it was in the beginning. So all of a sudden we had these little resale places that we could just pop up on the sidewalk like we were a normal little, you know, like we're selling dirty, dirty water dogs type of thing, you know, and all of a sudden. Dirty water dogs. You know, yeah. And all of a sudden we were here. And, you see those. Yeah. And we had, you know, we, we, did, we had pouch cocktails and we had everything else. And we were just kind of, you know, we went vendor. We went straight grassroots on the street in a protective environment for our staff. But, you know, we allowed them to kind of embrace the community they were in. So if it was community that needed to have a radio playing and your, you know, your different drinks up top and, you know, where each chef could run what menu they thought would serve their community best. Um, and that was a lot. I mean, that was a lot. I mean, I'm working on three ghost concepts currently, um, which for a company that's as old as ours to just, you know, pivot uh, into, into ghost town uh, is, is good. Um, yeah, I mean, we were certainly, we have mobile moving uh, plexi for the bars, which was a great design we first set up. And now we're just waiting for the bars to open, but we're, we're good to go there. Um, I think we've done a fair number of things, you know, to, to, to stress, but those, those would be the highlights, I think, so far. Okay. 
There's uh, several questions. Do you have an extra few minutes to stay on with us, Stephen? To... All the time that you need. Okay, great. Um, what do you consider your greatest career success and failure? Greatest success? Um, I, I guess my greatest success, I, I mean, geez, that's tough. I, I think it's still going. Um, I don't know if, I, I, I think navigating these hard waters has been a great success. I think getting, getting this far, uh, working for the companies and the people that I have has proven to be a great success. It's what's, it's what's put me into this position today. Um, I think watching those that I've mentored um, still reach out to me is probably my greatest success. Now I have a group of 20 some that still will phone me and ask advice or before they take a job or I go to their weddings now or, you know, things of this nature. And, and before they make a move, I'm the guy they call now. And, and, and that feels very strange um, because I still speak to my mentors. Um, and I feel like I'm a little bit into that position where I still have mine that, that I call. And now all of a sudden I've got those that call me and, you know, I get, I got a text the other day, Hey, watch, I was just on, you know, WUSA nine. Can you watch me? You know, it's on at 11 tonight. And I, I mean, I don't, I'm not up at 11, but, Yes, I will be tonight. And you know, as soon as the I will record it. minute clip was done, I said, my guy, you were amazing, right? And, you know, and I think that having that has been my greatest success. Um, I think you're speaking to the right crowd when you, when you say that, because I'm sure a lot of the seasoned managers that are on this call would feel very similarly, and they would answer it, the same way. It, it feels good. Transition uh, from going from the young guy to the old guy. Yeah. What the hell did that happen? <laughs> greatest failure. Uh, greatest failure. Um, I mean, I can think of specific times where I, you know, botched an event or something like that, that certainly um, was, was a bad day. Um, didn't reflect well. I, I, I think I do remember one where I, I wasn't thinking very much, but it was during a, a time where I, I didn't feel um, as valued as I thought I should have been. And, and I approached it, I thought as diplomatically as I could, but given now, when I look back at it, I was a bit of, um, I probably pushed a little further than what I should have. And I, and I sort of made some demands in a position where I didn't have a stool to make those demands. I, I went in a position to make those, um, decisions. And so, for example, I think I should be paid more. And, um, and it was a time where, you know, 2008, where there's a bit of a recession starting 2009. And, and I'm saying, you know, well, wh wh where's mine? And meanwhile, people are losing their jobs and yeah. their 401s. And, and, I, and I was so consumed with myself that I didn't, I guess I didn't see the big picture. And, and, and that was probably a um, immature and, and I didn't think that went out very well. Um, how about developing purveyor relationships? Any advice there? Oh, yeah. Um, so when I was joining Clyde's, the first thing, first people I call when joining any company is their purveyors, especially in a region that I know. If, if you treat your purveyors well, chances are you're a good company. I mean, it sounds freaky, but if the chefs are jerks to them or the company's jerks to them or something, they're the first to tell you. If they aren't paying their bills, if they're, you talk about an insider way I, the purveyors know everything about everyone around town they know what you're using how you're paying your bills how you treat their drivers they know everything and um so for me i know their names i like to learn their routes i like to you know give them a little i always make sure we have coffee in the morning for the early guys ready to go in a little styro cup how they like it with a little cream to sit beside it um i make sure we're there and we are very clear that we check in everything um you know, so be patient, but we're going to, we're not going to tell you, wait, it don't go. I can't find the purchaser. We'll just wait. No, they're on a delivery. Just jump on it. Have someone else go find your purchaser and they can take over when you're there. So for me, I, I love those guys. Cause all of a sudden you're getting the better produce, you're getting the better fish, you know, whatever it is, they come to you because they love you. You're a first stop. You're they, they put the, they'll, they'll bring the food where you want because they just love how you treat them as an individual. Um, you know, it, nothing better than and working on that relationship. And then if you have difficulties, you know, they throw out, you know, that person gets to change route and you call the company and say, Hey, listen, I don't, you got rid of 
Paul, you know, I love Paul, uh, you know, and what this new person needs a few things. Well, all of a sudden you have a voice. And, um, and if your drivers are good, I write letters or I'll call the, you know, head of the department or, or the company and say, I got to tell you, this guy, this driver, Brian, he is awesome. And because it, it reflects in their, they want to hear that they're doing a good job. And how often do you, do you report on your drivers when it's good? And we're very fast to blame purveyors. Let me also add that we're very fast to think it's the purveyor. They're not here. They brought the wrong stuff. This is junk. You know what? You think about how many mistakes we make in a day. Like, you know, little ones throughout our day, we make a ton. We just do. And, and it doesn't mean we're bad. It doesn't mean we're not trying. But we always are very quick to blame them. But then you go, okay, pull up the analytics. Let's see. You place your order three times late this week past the cutoff. You, you know, your driver said, you know, three times you didn't have the cooler ready to go or, you know, no one was there. The door was locked. No one unlocked it. They had to wait and call, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm always like, be very, you know, make sure your own backyard's well-groomed and trimmed and looks nice and, and, and treat them with the respect they deserve. It's a hard job. Um, and this is to piggyback off of that. Um, has any of that changed uh, since the beginning of the year, like with COVID? Um, have you changed how you are with your purveyors or has you, you getting product or whatever, how much has that changed and how has that reflected your relationship with them? Uh, it, you know, we met with all of our purveyors, sat down with them all as this was hitting because they got crushed like everyone else. Um, we went through and said, well, you know, where are we going to find pinch points and, and not, and, you know, the obvious first part was drivers, right? There was, they, they couldn't employ the same amount of drivers. And so routes were going to be, extended and longer and delivery times would be different. And, you know, we, we, I, I think it's that open communication. It certainly changed. Everything's changed. And, um, but having the understanding that they're trying to navigate this as we are and that they're running a business on tight margins as well. Um, you know, I think having that relationship up front and having those conversations up front prepared us all for, for what was coming. And, and because of that, we've navigated it quite well. It doesn't mean we're going to accept less quality. It doesn't mean we're going to, you know, say, oh, you just don't come today. It's not that. But we, we understand when you were here, typically at seven, you might not be here now until 10. Uh, okay, right. We'll deal with that. You're not going to carry, you know, uh, 12 lettuce blends. You're going to carry five. Uh, okay, let's work with that. Let's see what we can do. How about if I just make my own? I'll use uh, two of them and combine them. Fine. Right. We're going to figure it out together. Um, if you had inventory that you asked for them to bring in for you exclusively, don't leave them with it. You know, oh, there's only 30 cases. Ah, we're moving off of that. We changed the menu. Sorry. No, find a way. Use it up. Be respectful. Because um, it all comes back in the end, right? And and um, we want them around. We're big on local vendors. And we want to make sure they're around at the end of this um, as, as we want to be around at the end of this. Absolutely. Um, interested to hear more about the level of intensity at the inn. I was fortunate enough to dine there twice. Both times was blown away by the attention to detail. What is it like behind the curtain? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's intense is a great word, but, um, I, I will say it's fun. Um, there's something nice about when you walk into a place that, um, plays Gregorian chants all day long. Um, and you realize really quickly um, that you're in the major leagues and there isn't room for mistakes um, that will make it to the door. Let me rephrase that. There's always room for mistakes, but not those that'll ever get by. So the level of cook that you're hiring um, and, you know, from your pot washer, uh, that, you know, Jack Judd was with us forever. And um, I mean, you know, the way that he would clean a copper pot, the way we cleaned a stove at the end of the night, you know, you'd break down that kitchen and polish it twice a day. Uh, every bit came apart and got put back together. Um, every sauce was, you know, refined to a level that, you know, I, I haven't done since, quite frankly. I mean, you, you just, it's its that level. We'd have three people in Garmage just to push out, you know, four dishes. Each plate, you know, our greatest plate would have 26 touches on it. Um, we sanded carrots to ensure they were the right size. We peeled grapes. We... Um, I mean, it's endless. The, you, you know, every pasta was made just then for service, you know, and then moved at the end of the night because you couldn't, we wouldn't serve it then. You know, we had our, we started the garden um, when I was there. We did the chickens, we had sheep and llamas and all sorts of stuff. And it, everything about the place was just healthy. Um, but 
certainly you knew the expectation was to be um, amazing. You wanted people leaving there saying that's a value. And that's hard to do when you're charging those prices. But, but that's what we aim for. When people left, they would just say, you know, wow, wow. Right. I, it was the best money spent. And, um, and, that, and that's what you aim for. And that only comes if everyone is, is devoted to the, to the same level of cooking. You know, we'd blindfold ourselves, Patrick would blindfold us and we'd eat our new dishes and, and, and see how our, our senses picked up on different things and how, you know, how did, did, did you want one more bite? Did you want two more bites? Was that enough? Was the acids right? Was the texture right? Was, you know, don't worry about the site. We can make anything pretty, but you know, how do you, how do you set your day for that? And, um, and come in every single day and say, it needs to be mounted, a pinch of butter, a little fresh white pepper, a little, you know, shot of Sambuca in the red bell pepper soup or whatever it was. There was always this little, little next nod that you had to turn up in everything that you did um, to make it that great. And, and that's what's made him as successful as he's been. Awesome. Well, there's a lot of positive um, thank yous and excitement about your session today. We're going to end on this one. Uh, it says, your energy is refreshing and contagiously positive. How do you keep that attitude and energy up on a day-to-day -day basis? <laughs> thank you. Um, you know, that's, that, I don't, I don't know any other way, I suppose. I mean, that might be a cop-out word, but I, I feed off of this profession. I, I love it. Um, I think coming in, no one, I mean, look at these times now we're all employed, which is even better, but you know, you, you're, you're coming in and you get a chance every day to, to, you know, make someone happy, right? I mean, it's, it's probably the most selfless job that there is. You have an opportunity to teach, you have an opportunity to learn, you have an opportunity to put a smile on people face on people's faces. You have the opportunity to do so much in this world of hospitality that, I don't know, you know, it's a world of servitude and you better do it. If you're not happy, get out. It's way too hard to simply sit back and, and, and make your way through it slowly and painfully. I mean, you, you have to love it. And, um, and, and I'm fortunate to have found something that um, I love to do. And, and, and I guess it comes across in my day. When I, when I come in, I like to change the air. You know, I, I wanna be in a room and, and all of a sudden it's full of just, everyone is jazzed up to taste something, cook something, teach something, learn something. I, I just, I, and I think that, that if, if, you, if you, everyone kind of moves in that direction, it makes for a great workplace. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing your time with us today, your expertise, your passion. We really appreciate your time and being with us. Appreciate so, it. Yeah, great conversation today. Yeah. Thank you. Patrick. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Don't be a stranger. We'd love to have you back again some other time. Lots sure. of golf clubs on here, so start practicing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Understood. <laughs> thank you. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank, thank you. you. Bye-bye.